right. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, wherever you may be. Uh, I'm Mark Ogg, your CSI Next Chapter President for this year. Welcome to the November 10th chapter meeting. Um, we have a great presentation lined up for you today. Area separation wall systems designing better fire and sound protection uh, presented to us today by Thad Goodman with National Gypsum Company. And uh, or Thad is one of our uh, continuing chapter sponsors and none of this would be possible uh, without the involvement and participation of our chapter sponsors, which I will put a quick thank you out to everybody here, uh, National Gypsum, uh, especially thank you and for your presentation you're going to give to us here today. The Architectural Woodworking Institute, uh, Northern Facades, ATIS, um, and MK uh, Architectural Consultants, thank you all for your continued support of this, of this chapter that we have here. So um, with that being said, uh, I will go ahead and turn everything over to Thad. I will make sure that he's off mute, which he is, and uh, let Thad go ahead and introduce himself, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Thad, it's all yours. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate the opportunity to present to the, for the chapter. Um, area separation wall systems <clears throat> excuse me, are something that we get common questions about, and we certainly have in the last decade or so with all the multifamily um, and apartment projects that are going on between condos and podium construction, some of the things that are happening in the industry, <clears throat> excuse me. So we put this presentation together as a company. Uh, it is, let me click inside the screen here so I can get ready to go. Okay. Um, we are National Gypsum. We are the exclusive service provider for four different lines our gold bond building products, which is our drywall products, our permabase, which is our cement board, our finishing products, our pro form line, and we have a, a cover board line called Dexcel. We'll get into more of that later. This is an AIA presentation. It provides one LU HSW credit. Uh, for those of you that are on the line that need that, uh, we will be handling the certificates for this presentation. Uh, after this is over, I will get a list from Mark, and we will provide them. There will be a lady named Patty Farrell with a nationalgypsum.com uh, email address that will send the certificate. So that's, you will get them, and then we will report to AIA for you and register those. This presentation is copyrighted, but we'll be happy to provide a PDF for anyone who might be interested in it. So we're going to spend a little time today. Uh, the learning objectives are pretty simple. If you look at this picture on the right hand side, in the 70s, prior to the 70s and before the 80s, uh, this the little uh, roof line there, you can see uh, little parapet ap ap applications for those of us in the commercial market. But that extension there on the roof line, those are area separation walls between units, two hours of fire protection. And so in the prior to the 1990s, that's basically what we had. And we'll go over what they were and, and how they were installed. And we'll talk about some code requirements. Uh, and then we'll talk about some different of details that we have in the various systems. So again, code compliance, systems in general. We will spend some time for acoustics uh, because it does make a difference. It has made some changes in the way things are constructed. And then we'll actually review some common installation mistakes that we see out in the field and things that we can talk about. So we couldn't talk about an area separation wall system or a firewall without talking about the ultimate. Um, now, I'm sure that your particular owner doesn't have a budget that's uh, equal to what they used to spend to do this 2000 year project, 700 miles long. But when we talk about separating one thing from another, this is where we started. In the 19 in the 1880s, uh, fires in London created an opportunity for people to start to think about how they protect one unit from another. And that's really kind of where the area separation walls started. <clears throat> when we talk about code compliance, there's a couple different sections. One is the IBC, the other is the IRC. So the IBC's definition of a firewall is a fire resistant rated wall 
that goes from the footing to the roof line or beyond. <clears throat> Pretty simple. Um, there's a lot of words here, but that's basically what happens. When we think about the code sections where that's concerned with, uh, we're in the 700s, 706.2 to 6, where we talk about structural, horizontal, and vertical continuity. The IRC is a little different. The, R, the R, IRC gives us both a common wall option and then a double wall option. And so if you're in, if you're working in that particular segment of the business, R302 is where you'd be looking. To go back to the IBC, um, there's some concealed spaces and some fire blocking and draft stopping requirements. And we'll spend a lot of time talking about them as we go through this presentation. But basically the thought process is uh, at each floor line and each, each, you've got vertical and horizontal requirements where we start to think about how we stop fire if it starts in a space from moving to a different space. And you can see here some of the fire blocking techniques that are used. In this particular case, um, you can see, and hopefully you can see my mouse here, you can see you've got about a three quarter inch, about a one inch airspace here between the framing members and the line. And then they've used a blank or a scrap piece of shaft wall liner. And in this particular case, the inspector had actually probably asked them to do some additional um, sealant. So they've put some sort of a fire, fireproof caulking sealant in here. You can see the burn clips, we'll spend some time talking about them. Uh, as well. So 718.2.2 talks about concealed wall spaces and how fire blocking can needs to be provided in two different ways. It needs to be, be provided horizontally. Uh, and there are two restrictions. One is it's typically at each floor line or ceiling line. And then if it, the ceiling is, if the wall is larger than 10 foot, it, the interval cannot exceed 10 foot. And then vertically the same way at the ceiling and floor levels. Then as we get into concealed spaces, and again, you can see in this particular area, you can see the, the stud turned sideways here as a nailer. That'll be a roof, that'll be a piece of drywall there. So that'll be the ceiling in this unit, wherever it's at the first floor or second floor. And then we need to also have protection up in our concealed spaces as well. So you're gonna have the same restrictions from the top to the bottom of the system. Area separation walls themselves have been around a long, long time. And as a former drywall contractor, I can tell you that in the 60s and 70s, when we'd show up on a job and there was an area separation wall, this is what it looked like. Masonry construction is still, in my mind, the best option. Uh, it's a little more expensive, it's a little more labor and time consuming, but that's a fantastic wall right there. And that's basically what we saw for years and years and years. Uh, it is a high strength wall. These advantages here are, and for those of you in the Southern and Southwestern areas where the bugs never die, it is termite resistant. Uh, fire and impact resistant. And the nice thing is it's self-supporting. So this is one of those areas where this is kind of the Cadillac of the area separation wall. From a limitation perspective, you know, it's the most expensive wall you can build or one of the most expensive. Uh, it takes a little more labor. You have to call a separate trade in to be working on the project. If you've got multiple units and you've got several of them in a, in a situation like we saw earlier where you have four or five in a building, you know, you've got a thicker wall, so you've got a, a lot more, a bigger footprint. And then of course, for those of us in the Northern Tundra, I'm in Ohio, and for those of us in the North, you know, it's dependent upon weather. So there's times where we can work on it and times where we can't, we just physically can't get the product to dry. The good news is it works. Uh, here's a picture from a townhome. So this was masonry construction and fire gutted the, the middle unit and nothing happened on either side. 
That's a, this wall did exactly what it was supposed to do. Protected the people on either side from that poor soul that was in the middle that, that lost some of their belongings. As we think about some more sustainability options, you know, uh, ICF, insulated concrete form construction, has become popular over the years. And you can see, uh, you can see from here, as you look across the middle of these, you can see the area separation walls going up in these areas as well. And the theory is the same. Uh, the thought process is the same. You know, you've still got concrete, only now it's a solid poured wall and it's insulated on both sides. These come in different thicknesses. Uh, you can have it as little as four and you can have it as large as 12, depending on how, how these forms are put together and how much footing you need. But it's the same basic thought process. You're using concrete to create that two hour separation. So as you might expect, the advantages and the limitations are the same. It's a wonderfully high strength wall. Again, for those areas where it makes a difference, it is termite resistant. You've got all the fire resistance that you need. Uh, it's very energy efficient is one additional advantage that you have here, which is the reason they use these systems. But again, it's more expensive. It's probably the most expensive overall because of the insulation you have on both sides. Separate trade, larger footings, weather dependent. For developers that are doing multifamily construction, probably the most popular item is double walls. Uh, two one hour fire rated wall assemblies that are constructed on site. So you've got inexpensive material because it's always, it's already there. You've got a thinner wall than CMU and you've got it installed by the same contractor. So you don't have to bring in an additional labor force. And while we're on this picture, I'll just make a quick comment. When we do these in person, I often get questions about, okay, how do they get the drywall in the center of this thing? This makes no sense to us. And so if you think about the construction of an area separation wall, typically it's put together, unless it's a masonry wall, it's typically put together story by story as the building is framed up. And so when they get the first part of the first floor, uh, when they're working on the slab, they'll go ahead and they'll build this wall up the eight foot, 10 foot, whatever they need it to be. They'll build it on the ground. They'll put the drywall on one side and then they'll lift it up into place. So when they lift it into place to put the nailer down uh, to secure it with this pin, they've already got the drywall on one side. They do that on both sides. So when they throw it together, they've got the drywall in the side. So that constitutes two one hour fire rated walls that gives you the protection that you need. It does have some limitations. Probably the two biggest limitations that we see is it's not approved for use in all jurisdictions. So while this is acceptable in many, many places, there are some code areas where this is not something that can be used. So you'd always wanna make sure you check your local codes before you went down this direction. And then there are no mechanicals allowed in these two walls. So while you've got a little thinner footprint, then you need to put another wall on top of them if you're gonna have mechanicals, like let's say in a bathroom, somewhere like that. So those are probably the two biggest things that we see across the country. In the 1990s, the Gypsum Association was approached to say, okay, is there a way that we can create a product and a system put together so that you can give that same two hour protection in a smaller space? Um, and several different companies worked together. There was a lot of testing that was done. And so basically, this is the system that came. It was designed to be a self-supporting wall. It's a non-load bearing wall, but it's a self-supporting wall that can go up to several feet. We'll talk about limitations in a second. Um, and it would go from the slab either to the roof line or through the roof line. And it was designed so that it will fall away. One side of the wall will fall away from the other and leave this one remaining. So that's an alternative to the cement, uh, the masonry walls that we talked about or the poured in place concrete or the double wall that we talked about earlier. So this is just another way to skin the cat that all, all of these do the same thing. They provide two hours of protection from one unit to the other. The good news is they work really well. Uh, here's an example of a job that was in progress. If you look, uh, look closely at the windows, you can see there are still stickers in the window. 
Um, there was a fire that got started on this particular project while it was in progress. And it basically this unit burnt to the ground and the area separation walls did exactly what they were supposed to do. They stayed in place and protected the units on each side. I guess the good news is they already had a low on the job so they could start to clean things up. But this is exactly what it was, this is exactly what these walls are designed to do. Area separation walls have some limitations like every other system. Uh, one is they're limited in how high they can go. If you have a two hour area separation wall, you're limited to 66 feet. And this is kind of a cutaway of what one would look like. Um, this is a two hour rated wall. And so you've got two layers of one inch shaft wall liner that are joined together into, a, into an H stud or a CH stud system that kind of goes together like a puzzle. And then you use fire blocking in between the unit and between the, the floors like we talked about. Vertically and horizontally, we're limited to 10 feet by code. And on each side of this, they have a little area separation wall clip, a little aluminum clip that allows, if the fire starts, that allows instead of when that wall starts to collapse in on itself, because that's typically what happens. You get the fire that happens and then they, the, the floor starts to give way and it starts to want to pull the rest of the system in. When that happens, um, you know, these clips have burnt off by that point. And so they separate from this wall without pulling it along with them. Now these area separation wall clips have some limitations. Um, if you're doing a system that's 23 feet or less, you have these clips that go every 10 feet. If you have a system that goes up to 54 inches or 54 feet, then from that 23 foot to that 54 foot, uh, there are five inches on center or five foot on center. And then for larger walls, if you have a larger wall up to 66 feet, you'd have to have the clip spaced 39 inches on center, or yeah, inches on center from that 54 to that 66 foot. So this is one of the areas where we installers sometimes struggle with that. This is probably the question we get the most is the placement of the clips. Something that's unique in our industry that did not exist eight years ago, you can actually get a three hour area separation wall. Uh, now the limiting heights on this is about the same, a little different, 70 feet tall. And the reason for that is the basically that what we see, where we see this used the most is in podium construction. So you've got a concrete deck, you've got a mixed use or parking underneath that's so popular right now. And then you have wood frame construction on top of it. So this one can go up a little bit farther. But basically, in addition to that two hours of, or that two layers of gypsum in the middle, you have an additional layer of type C on both sides of the shaft wall liners. That's, that's the additional part of protection that gives us, takes us from two hours to three hours. Everything else is pretty much the same. Um, we go, we use the same basic clip placement, that sort of thing. So we've talked a little bit about components. Maybe we got ahead of ourselves just a little bit, but let's talk a little bit about how this system goes together and how it's made. Um, there's several different products that you can use in this side of this. When you think about what these drywall panels themselves are, there's a couple manufacturers out there that still make a paper, a regular paper faced gypsum panel. And again, these are two inches, two inch or an inch thick with beveled edges and two feet wide. And you'd place one in uh, and they would go in between these studs. As you look at this picture, of this gentleman working there. In this particular case with paper faced gypsum, the system would need to be protected from damage for moisture. So one of my counterparts, Pat Grutledge, who's probably on the call today, out in California, she doesn't have to worry too much about this. They don't get a lot of rain out there. They're in the middle of a huge drought. But in Ohio, where I live, uh, the likelihood of anybody doing this construction for a week or two or three at a time without having some sort of rain or moist, excessive moisture, probably not. So paper face is acceptable. It was used for years, but there are some other options that are out there that are better. Uh, there is a paper-faced mold and mildew treated product that's available. And then there's a fiberglass matte gypsum 
panel that's available. And most of the manufacturers, all the ones that I know, recommend fiberglass mat gypsum panels for these area separation walls. As again, if you think about what we're doing, you're constructing these as they go up. So you put up this particular piece, you've got, you can see the lower right-hand picture there. You've got a 10 foot piece that went up there. You built your area separation wall and you start to frame out from it. So you frame to the first floor and then you'd put this, the deck on and you put the second floor up. So if you think about this, these things are gonna be exposed for some time. These fiberglass mat panels have a 12 month extended exposure warranty similar to the sheathing that we see on the outside of buildings across the country. They're mold and mildew resistant, uh, score a perfect 10 on the ASTM 3273. We've got coated flats, they're dimensionally stable. Uh, this is the Cadillac, this is what we actually recommend. So you've got three options. You've got the un, untreated paper, the regular paper facers, which are acceptable and were used for several years with some protection on them. You've got treated paper facers, which is paper that's treated with mold and mildew, mungus, moldicides and fungicides. And if they get incidental moisture, if they had a sprinkle or if they had a little bit of water that a passing shower wouldn't be a big deal, you could be using them. And then the fiberglass mat facer panel is that 12 month exposure warranty that goes all the way through. They come in three traditional lengths, eight foot, 10 foot and 12 foot. They're each one inch thick, they're two inches wide. They're two inches or two feet wide, easy for me to say. And here's what one looks like. You've got these little beveled edges on here because they're going to fit into the C-track or the H stud or the I stud, uh, which is this mechanism right here in the center. So you've got a track that goes all the way around them, a cap track, and then you would in the center, you'd start to put these two pieces in and then you'd snug it in with another product. Here's what that looks like. So you've got your sea runner at the bottom and are on each side and around the top that would totally encompass that particular area of, of the gypsum. And then you've got your H stud in the center and then you slide in two pieces and that's why the bevel is there, why the bevel is there on these products. So you will slide those two in. Now these are exactly two inches. So they're meant to accept those two panels and fit snugly. The C runner, as you can see, is two and an eighth inches. And that's important because the, the H stud has to fit inside this as well. So that'll become important as we talk about some of the common installation mistakes, you'll understand why that happens. And then the system is held together with, or at least snugged up to the wall, it's held together with these burn clips, these aluminum burn clips. These connect the framing to the firewall. And during a fire, these start to burn off at about 1100 degrees. So this aluminum will separate. So when the wall starts to fall, the thing that was holding it securely in place dislodges and falls away. So it doesn't pull the other side, the other wall there. The clip spacing, as we talked about earlier, is dictated by the height of the wall overall. I'll make a quick note while we're here looking at this photo. These are spacers, one way or the other. You only need one screw in each side of these to hold these together. We get out on job sites all the time and we'll see two screws here and three screws there. So you've got five total screws in this clip. You really only need one, need one on each plane, the vertical and the horizontal. So just a quick note, if you're out doing CA work and you're doing some inspections, uh, and you only see one, that's totally acceptable. That's actually the way it's tested. So here's a good example of a cup of one. You can see that they've got the blocking here uh, as required, you know, at the floor level. And this is basically holding this system away about an inch from the wall itself, which three quarters is code. And then you can see that we've got these burn clips that are placed here. Um, now, obviously this one is, maybe this is a taller one because you've got five feet. And so here's what the clip would look like when it's in place and it's done correctly. There are several different types of screws and systems that put this together. Obviously the ram set 
we put the pins in the track itself. If we think about down here in this area where we're going to put the track on the floor, we'd want to shoot it into the concrete there every 24 inches or less. And then we start to use different sorts of screws depending on what we need for size um, to connect the C track to the C track, to connect the breakaway clips. Uh, we use pan heads in that case, one way or the other, depending on the gauge of them, whether it's do we need an S12 or an S12 or an, a regular sharp point. So we start to think about how we start to put this system together. And then I mentioned that there's a minimum three quarter inch airspace that's needed in between the two layers of gypsum, the area separation wall itself. And let's, let me just say real quickly while we're looking at this graphic, this is your two hours of protection. These two layers, one inch layers of gypsum a piece create two solid inches of gypsum and that creates your two hour protection. So it doesn't matter what type of drywall is on either side, it could be half inch on this side of this wall, on the interior of this wall, it doesn't matter because here's your two hours of protection. By code, you need to have three quarters of an inch between this product and where the wall is. And that's where the, that's where the spacing on the clips comes in. That's how we have the different, that's why we have the different holes in the clips because depending on where they're placed in, in how the wall bows, sometimes they move a little bit, sometimes they're a little crooked, um, you know, because wood tends to move, you're good to go. There are contractors that put rock wool in here and mineral wool is 100% acceptable to be used in these situations. But the gypsum industry recommends, and we recommend as a manufacturer, we recommend that you would use a sample piece that takes some of the cuts from this liner that you use, and you would use these as blocking. The reason you do that is because when the code official comes in, let's say you put this wall in place and you put a couple other, you're building up, you've got two more stories on top of it. And so you get a little pressure on this wall, uh, on this part of the wall. And all of a sudden now it starts to bow a little bit. Now you don't have three quarters of an inch that you thought you did. And the inspector comes in and says, this is a problem. So if you have a one inch piece of liner right here, you never have to worry about that. The inspector can come in and quickly take a look and say, okay, I know there's three quarters of an inch because there's an inch product in the way. When we talk about vertical continuity, if there's no parapet, if this does not extend past this, the roof line itself, and most, and a lot of them don't anymore, I won't say most, in my area, most of them die at the roof line, then there's a requirement because of the fact that you've got maybe something burning over here on one side of the system for up to two hours to stop things from igniting on the other side, there's a requirement that you use three quarter or fire pre plywood that goes from the wall itself out four foot. And you can see in this picture, the different coloration of the product. So this is fire treated plywood to meet code. This is one of those areas that occasionally gets missed by the framing contractor. They put the wrong product up or they, they weren't aware of what happened. Maybe it's somebody that they farmed the system out to. Uh, and so in the cases where this is not a fire treated plywood, there is a fairly simple solution. You can take 5 8 drywall on either one of these assemblies. You can take 5 8 type X drywall and you can put it up there uh, and you can put it in place. You can secure it to the roof line. You can use a couple of ledgers to make sure it's nice and solid. And that is acceptable from a code perspective to be able to meet that four foot requirement. And that would have to be on both sides of the wall. So you have one on this side, you have one on the other side. But if you get into a situation where this did not happen as it was maybe designed by your, when you put together your plans, um, there is a fix for that that's relatively simple. Hey, Fad. Yeah. Uh, we have a couple questions here uh, before you jump onto that next slide. Um, first one uh, is five screws going to change uh, integrity in the spacer? Good question. Fantastic question. And, and let me just, like I said, we see this all the time where there's five screws in there. Let me be very clear. This is the weak point in the link, and this is the part that will melt the first. And so as it starts to pull away, it doesn't matter whether there's five screws in there, four screws, three screws, or one screw. Uh, just from a standpoint of cost and installation time, it only requires one. So 
it's kind of like a UL assembly. We've tested to the minimum. If you overbuild it, if you put five screws in there, you've just spent a little extra time and a little extra money. Good okay. question. All right, and the next one we got, uh, in old masonry separation wall construction, you'd see the walls extending up through the roof. With the gypsum-based area separation wall systems, has that requirement gone away, or how are you dealing with the separation at the roof level? Okay, yeah, and, that, and that's, I'm glad you asked that on this particular slide because there's two answers to that question. Number one, it has not gone away. Um, there is still an option, and we'll see it a little bit later in the presentation. To, and depending on the local code, and I'll, I'll give two answers here. Number one is there are local codes where you have to go 18 inches past the roof line, and that's due to the local code. There are areas where you could let it die at the roof line, similar to what we see in this picture. So depending on the jurisdiction that you're working in and the local code restrictions that are there, there are two different options. There is a gypsum detail that takes it past the roof line. And we'll, like I said, we'll look at them in a little while as we start to look at options and different ways to build things. Uh, in this particular case, the fix for the second part of that question was how do you deal with that is just what we're talking about right here. We're going to protect on four foot on each side of that assembly. We're gonna protect with more fire resistant products. Uh, assuming let's say there's asphalt shingles up there, they're tough to burn anyway. You're not going to worry about them, but it's the product underneath them that you'd be concerned about. And so that's why we use the fire treated plywood. Or if it wasn't put into place, we use the ledgers right here to be able to cool that system down on both sides and to be able to, if there's, you've got shingles on the top, let's say you've got drywall on the bottom. So this isn't going to burn out too far in the middle. And so that's the reason that we recommend this, these two areas as a fix. Good question. All right. Thanks for asking. Okay, so now we get up into the attic space and in, in this particular picture, you can see that it would be pretty easy to put a piece of drywall right there if you needed to, if the code required it to be in the ceiling in the plenum area. Uh, but there are, if we have exposed, it, there are jurisdictions where, um, you know, there are some attic accessibility requirements that vary by municipality or jurisdiction. And there are times where they've maybe had some, they've been burnt somewhere, they've had some sort of a situation where they will say, you need to cover up these pieces of metal, these H studs. And the thought process behind that is, if this piece of metal is exposed to flame for up to two hours, they're concerned that maybe somebody in this attic space, you know, there was a crawl space here and somebody put some paid newspapers up there, they were storing some sort of Christmas decorations or something, and they had something that was laying right against this metal that would give it an additional ignition point. And so that would weaken that metal. And maybe as that wall wanted to start to fall away, it would start to fall away and it would maybe pull these open and you'd have some sort of air that goes through there. So in those particular cases, those jurisdictions, and this is not everywhere, but there are places where this is required, they will ask you to put a gypsum batten on top of those exposed metal areas and that way, even in addition to the three quarter inch airspace, you've got some protection if there's something laying up in that area. So that's one of those little nuances that we see and we've heard about across the country. So we wanted to put it in here and just say, this may be an option, you may have to do it. And if you do, this is why. So at each floor ceiling intersection, there is a requirement to have horizontal blocking. And you can see the cutaway here, that's kind of that extra one inch of gypsum on both sides that we talked about. And again, this could be mineral wool. There's no reason why it couldn't, but we recommend that you use this just to make sure that you've got that three quarter inch airspace that we needed, because that's a minimum. And again, once you start to stack units on top of each other, the wood, wood tends to move and expand and contract. And this way the code official knows you've got that one inch in there. Um, Plus it's just a little tighter and you're going to have a, a product that's more solid to be able to block any kind of fire that if it starts down here and it wants to rise up here, we're protecting that extra unit or that second floor of that unit. So we'll get into some of the, some of the plan views and some of the cutaways that we see here. Um, if you look at from a foundation perspective, it's pretty simple. You know, you put your C-track down, you pin it 24 inches on center max or more frequently, you put your two layers of gypsum in there, you've got your three quarter inch airspace. And like I said, this is your fire protection. This is your two hour protection. 
it doesn't matter whether you have half inch or five eighths over here, that wall doesn't need to be rated for the most part. When you make a corner, uh, the code will require that you, you know, you've got a C stud here, you've got maybe a, a C stud here. The code will require that you make sure that you push that two layers back. It shouldn't meet right here because then you've got a weak point. We're going to push these two layers back to the back of that area separation wall. And there are times where there are units that are front and back in buildings. And so in this case, you take a couple of C tracks and marry it with an H stud and you can build off of all four of those. So you've got a four way intersection detail there as well. And later on in the presentation, we'll spend a little time talking about a resource that we have that shows all these details in it if you don't have it in your library. Here we are, we talk a little bit about the, for the question that was asked earlier, which was a very good question. Again, this picture at the bottom, um, masonry construction, that's back in the 70s when I was doing drywall in the 80s, that's what we saw all the time. So depending on the jurisdiction, this can be anywhere from 16, 18 inches to 30 inches with a requirement of how far it needs to extend past the roof line. If you're using gypsum to do that, here's the roof parapet detail that we would use. You know, there's a cap required and you've got framing on both sides. You'd have your two hours of gypsum, your two layers of gypsum that would extend to that top of that cap. And so that would be the way that you would extend that to the roof and you would still give that protection, whatever that system is there, whatever that municipality's requirement is, 16 inches, 20 inches, 34 inches, whatever it is, that would be how far you'd have to take it up. And then again, we talked about, we saw that picture earlier where there are areas where you're allowed to let it die at the roof line. And when you do, you'd either have fire treated plywood on both sides, or you'd have a ledger system that you would create here if that didn't happen that went out four foot on either side of that roof junction detail. Exterior walls. There are times, let me just go here so you have a visual. There are times where an area separation wall will stretch out past on a, on a uh, vertical plane, past where it typically, where, where the, where what we would happen to think that two hour protection would be needed. So if you don't have that happen, you know, here's a detail that shows your exterior wall junction. You basically, you've got your blocking on both sides that's required to make sure you've got your horizontal and vertical continuity. You take it right to the, to the outside of the sheathing or the plywood and you let it die there. If you have to go out past, it's the same basic thing that we talked about with the, um, with the roof parapet. You're going to protect it on both sides with a little bit of extra gypsum as well in that area where you've got the, where you meet with the, with the wall detail. And again, I'll go back here. This one is farther out than we typically see it. Uh, we like to see this about four foot or less as a manufacturer. But in this particular case, this is a great example because it gives us some, some visuals that we can talk about. In this case, now you've got a little wind load uh, requirements here for this wall as well. You know, depending on what type of product that's gonna go over there, you know, you're gonna get a little bit of movement in that area. So in that case, we asked that the clip be put on the top and the bottom of those assemblies where they stretch out past that line of the, other, of the other building. So I'll go back to this one just for a second. You can see the C-track that's wrapped around here. The C-track is required at the bottom. The C-track is required to go on the outside of the product. And then the C-track is required to be turned downward on top of this layer. And then another C-track is required to be turned over and put screws in it. And then you build from there. So I wanted to use this visual because it's a great visual to have that conversation because we'll talk about that in a second as well. But when you extend out past, when you've got one side of this that's exposed or you've got some little bit of a possible wind load issues, that's where we start to do clips on the tops and the bottom. So that's a little different, that's a unique situation. You know, and again, even, even in our graphics, you can see we put two screws in this one, which is not necessary, but yeah something we talk about with the marketing department. So from an acoustical standpoint, uh, we talked at the very beginning about the fact that area separation walls create that two hour protection that's needed to keep people safe in between multifamily units. So when you 
meet that 50, and that's typically a 50 STC, it's what the IBC and the IRC use. So you should specify and use acoustical consultant between the slab and the bottom edge of the gypsum board to make sure you've got good solid sound protection down there. Uh, you should insulate the wall stud cavity, and we'll see why in a minute. Seal all the penetrations, and then there's a, another product, acoustically enhanced amp panels, that can get you into luxury specs that we'll show here in a second. One of the things, and for those of you that have been around a while, you'll, re you'll remember there was a time where we had like seven or eight legacy building codes across the country, and then they consolidated into the IBC and the IRC. When they consolidated and there became one nationally accepted code, one of the requirements in that code changed a little bit from what we had seen previously in the legacy codes. Not all the legacy codes had a 50 STC as a minimum requirement in multifamily, but when they consolidated, there were enough, there was enough support that they moved to that 50 STC. Well, if you think about what our traditional masonry wall was, it was an eight inch CMU wall. And now all of a sudden, the most common area separation wall that was used didn't meet the requirement for STC. So there were two things that happened. Uh, the first thing that probably happened that was the easiest was, okay, well, we're in progress. We've already got this eight inch wall up here. We're gonna go ahead and we're gonna just add some, we're gonna put some battens up here. We're gonna put some nailers up here, uh, furring strips, and we're gonna go ahead and put a couple layers of gypsum on both sides. So that easily got you to 56 STC, but now you're introduced another product into that system and you had to do that before you framed up the wall or you had all kinds of issues there. The next logical step was to basically go to a 12 inch CMU wall that met the 50 requirement, but now you're using even more space and incurring more cost than you did before. The ICF has been created long after the legacy codes went, but so you need to know that as they have different links, you can go anywhere from a 50 to a 56 STC. And again, you've got insulation on both sides of that wall that's helping you from a sound perspective to meet those STC requirements. So as we start to look at an STC rating chart, we can see right off the bat that that 8 inch CMU that was the most popular didn't meet the most common requirement of the code from a sound perspective. And so there were other areas that gave you opportunities. And then as the, as, as the area separation wall, the gypsum walls came into being, uh, you can see that some of them, before I move from this screen, you can see that several of them exceed those requirements that we have for sound. So let's look at them in a little more detail. Uh, number one is the battens. Battens by themselves have been tested and they're only a 35 STC. But think about the fact that you've got some CAC protection in the sense that when you have exposed battens only in that, plan, in that plenum or that attic area, you've also got the CAC protection that comes from those half inch or five eighths gypsum horizontal planes because you're up in a plenum area. So you still reach the 50 STC that you need. It just, it just it, you have a couple different systems that you're using to make it happen. So this is still acceptable in the system. Normally, from an STC perspective, insulation doesn't make a huge difference. Uh, if you take a typical wall, a three and five eighths metal stud wall, you throw insulation in there, that adds two to three STC points. But when we get to double wall applications, we get a huge bump just by adding insulation into the system. So here in figure 247, you can see that no insulation at all gets you a 41, and that doesn't get you where you need to be from a perspective of meeting the code but you put simple insulation in that system and you move immediately, you get a 20 point bump, which is huge from an STC perspective. So that's probably the most common wall that's out there. There are some other products that are available. You can, if you wanted to go to a little luxury spec area, which we typically think we get into that uh, 65, 66, 67 area, that's really a, an interesting wall. You can add damped panel products, the ones that have the viscoelastic polymer in there, they're more expensive, but they will help you get there. So let's take a minute and go through some common installation mistakes. In this particular case, you can see it on both sides of this picture, they didn't have the C-track at the top of this system. They also have a gap here, which is unacceptable, but they didn't have the C-track at the top of this system, which was the thing that was flagged by the in inspector. 
it's important to have those H studs go from the floor all the way to the roof line. And in this particular case, there were several areas where there was a shortage for whatever reason. I don't quite understand how that's happened. But in this particular case, um, the inspector flagged these particular products as not being acceptable because you didn't have that H stud go all the way through. So you've got a weak spot there. You've also got an area where air could start to work its way through. Again, when we, we saw that exterior picture, I talked about how you put your C-track at the bottom, you put your C-track at the top, and then there has to be a C-track that's turned downward at each junction. And then there's another C-track that's turned away and you build upward. So typically you have screws that you screw those two C-tracks together to hold them together and make them consistent. In this particular case, um, the installer did not put a C-track on either one of these sides. They just took the raw gypsum and put it on each, they took the raw gypsum here and just stacked another piece on top of it. Not acceptable and that was good news for them. They tried to maybe hide it by the fact that they coated those joints and felt like that putting some sort of a coating on there, a joint compound coating would have helped them, but it didn't. They had to go ahead and put some gypsum blocking on both sides, a patchwork, like I said. We talked earlier about the double stud walls and how you couldn't put mechanicals in the double stud walls. With an area separation wall, you can have mechanicals in the wall, but you can't have them protruding into that three quarter inch air space. So in this particular case, these pipes that run horizontal and vertical here, these, these white pipes, plastic pipes, they're too far back into that cavity. They needed to be at, in this cavity itself. They need to be outside that one inch liner right there that I'm touching. So in this particular case, they had intruded into that common space and they were sitting against that wall. Now think about maybe having a fire on the other side of that wall for up to two hours and how hot that surface would get and it would melt those pipes. So that's why you need to keep them outside. Hey, Thad, real quick on that last picture. Yeah. So where those pipes are, mm -hmm. uh, you said they're protruding into that space. Are they more, should they be more on the stud itself? Or which yeah, they, they shouldn't they shouldn't go past if you see this stud right here that has the wire attached to it, you know, they shouldn't they shouldn't protrude back past that area. They should stay ah, out okay. in that area right there. Got so it. it's not that they can't be in this space where the studs are themselves, they can't be back against that wall. They can't be in that little one inch air space back there. Got it. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good question. Now here's another one where again we've had an interruption in the wall. And again, this has to be a continuous two hour protection. And you can see that there's a pipe that there's a pipe going this way and there's a pipe that was framed in going the other way. So in this particular case, we've got an interruption in that wall and that's not acceptable per code. So that had to be fixed. We talked earlier about the fact that the C stud is two and eight inches thick and the H studs are two inches thick to accept the gypsum in the middle of them. What sometimes happens for some reason is that you'll have an installer who will turn that H stud sideways and they'll try to cram it down on top of that two inch. Um, instead, of, instead of doing, instead of using it like it's what C track here, they'll take an H stud and they'll try to cram it. And it's exactly the same size as these vertical ones here. And so what happens is it, it they have to kind of cram it down there and they create a problem with. You can see right here on the right hand side, um, they could create a problem with that damaging that core. And so in this particular picture on the left hand side, there's a little bit of white showing there. There's a little bit of white showing here. As I move my mouse around, hopefully you can all see it. So there's all these areas where there's been disruptions in the mat or the paper itself and inspectors will flag that and they'll want that fixed because that's they consider that a weak spot. For example, here's a bigger, a bigger look at it. Here's one where maybe a forklift, this almost looks like a forklift to me, where it was the product was pulled off the job and maybe it was skinned by a forklift. Uh, that looks like that'd be about the right size for that. And that product shouldn't have been used in that area because now it's, it's exposed and that mat has been compromised and they'll have a problem, the inspectors will have a problem with that. So how do you fix that? Well, um, if you have to fix, if you have to fix a hole somewhere, we ask that you cut it out. This is a detail in one of our books. You cut it out, you friction fit two pieces in there, and then you put another piece on each side that goes from stud to stud and screw it to there. 
So you've created this, there's a weak spot here because these have gaps in them. You know, they're just friction fit in, but you've created protection on both sides. So literally you have four inches of product as opposed to two inches. So they accept it. Those are typically accepted pretty easily. So in this particular case, here's an area separation wall that worked the way it was supposed to. A real world situation, you can see in this particular case, there was a step down here. Uh, there was not there. So this area separation wall died on here at the roof line, but because they had it correctly protected, you didn't see too much fire intrusion on the other side. There'll be a little bit of repair there, but nobody in this unit was damaged. And then of course, it's that's because of the step down, they went up the 24, 14, 18 inches, whatever they needed. And so in this particular case, this wall worked exactly like it was supposed to. Here's one that didn't. Here's one where they had a fire in this part of the building and because it wasn't, it wasn't protected correctly, uh, as the fire came up, it spread across the roof line from both sides and damaged all the units. So we've had several questions. Um, Mark, I'll just ask quickly, is there anything else in the chat that I, we need to address? Uh, nothing, nothing that we already haven't addressed, Dad. Okay. Well, well, give me a couple minutes while we go through. Again, you saw this slide earlier. I'll just talk a little bit about our company. Um, this is our team. Um, I cover the Great Lakes in the, in the upper Midwest. Pat Grelich, who is, I think is helping me out on the call today. Uh, she covers the Western states. Frank Fuller, he's also a fellow in CSI. Uh, he covers the, the Southwest area. Alan Zedek covers the Gulf and the Southeast region. And then Scotty Hughes, is my counterpart and he takes care of the Northeast and the, the, the ALA, the Mid-Atlantic, Mid what we consider the Mid-Atlantic in the Northeast and CSI world. Um, Amy Hawkett is our boss. She is actually a registered architect. And so we call on architects for a living and we have an architect who helps us do that. So what a great way to have a, a teammate. What a great leader for our team. We, if you have to call, if you can't get a hold of myself or any one of these people in your area, um, you can call 1-800-NATIONAL between eight o'clock Eastern time and 4.45, and you'll talk to one of these three gentlemen. We don't have a phone tree. You might get a voicemail and say, we'll call you back, and then they do, but normally one of these three answers the phone. Mark Chapman is the guru of tech. He's been there 42 years at National. He does our fire testing and our sound testing, and he sits on the Gypsum Association, helps with the GA600, several different committees for the Drywall Finishing Council. Uh, he's our go-to guy. In the middle, you've got Jimmy Farrell. He's a former general contractor. So if you have a need to talk to someone from a CA perspective, he's a great person to talk to. And then the fellow in the right here who's seated, he's not a midget, he's just seated. Um, that's Sam Haverson. He is an architect also by trade. He works on our tech line and he has helped us develop some resources that well, we'll talk about here in a second, our purple book and our sound book. So as architects, go to nationalgypsum.com, design and resource center. We have fire and sound designs, the most commonly used one to four hour fire and sound design page, which is probably pretty helpful. Uh, specifications, we have drop-in specs, master spec, a true, RIB, whatever we call ourselves these days. All of our product and literature is there. If you do not have or have not downloaded the Purple Book 2, uh, this is a product that we put together, and when Sammy came to us, he said, there are certain things that I had uh, trouble finding, and I'd like to have these details from a manufacturer's best practice perspective outlined, and so he has all them. We have the sound book, which has 315 different rated assemblies that go 16 on center, 24 on center, wood studs, and chase walls. So if you need them, they're out there. Our XP drywall product line is our mold and mildew paper-faced product line that covers a wide variety, all of our different products, so shaft wall, sound break, you know, our, our viscoelastic polymer product, our dance panel, high impact, high abuse. You see the purple on the outside of the buildings everywhere, the purple, the gold, and the green, or we, we have a full line of our XP products, uh, our tile backer, and our interior extreme, which is our uh, internal drywall that can be used before the building is dried in. Our perma-based product line is the lightest weight in the in the industry. These little bubbles here, these little things are styrofoam. They make it lighter and a little more water protective. 
We have a insulated panel product, a CI panel that you can use in CI application. So you can put up your poly ISO and your substrate all in one time, instead of having two different trades wrap around the building twice. And you can put your thin brick, your culture stone or your EIFS over top of it. We have a Dexel roof board, uh, which is a mechanically attached, uh, fully adhered for roofing systems, poly ice, um, your, your TPO and, and all those. Oh, we're gonna use solvent, we, we've already got it coated. And then we have a cement board product line that helps in those areas where you have moisture from inside the building as well as outside the building. So if you think about natatoriums, uh, water treatment plants, places like that, where you have concern about moisture from both sides. So that's a little more robust cover board or underlayment, and it can be used there. Our ProFoam products, we have a full line of pro of joint compound products, setting compounds and boxes and buckets that are used out on job sites. Contractors uh, use them on a regular basis. We're the preferred product in many places in the country. We're committed to sustainability. So we have our Declare labels and our EPDs and HPDs, our Green Guard Gold products. If you have questions, reach out to us. We'll be happy to help you. These, again, are also located on the design and resource part of our website. Whew. Okay, Mark, I think I'm done. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you, Thad. Uh, excellent, <clears throat> excellent content and presentation, as always. Much appreciated. Um, we are up against the end of our hour here, folks. And thank you everyone who was able to join us today. Um, December 9th will be our December program and that will be presented by the Architectural Woodworking Institute. Uh, we will be covering the, uh, I believe it is the AWI 200 uh, standard for care and storage of casework, which uh, I, I myself know um, needs to be adhered to. Uh, it, it's a good, uh, good, good standard to go by. And I think it will be a really great presentation uh, from AWI, again, one of our, our chapter sponsors. Um, <clears throat> please stay in touch with us uh, via the csinext.org website. And if you are on LinkedIn, we have just launched the LinkedIn group for CSI Next. Uh, look it up under the groups, uh, request an invite, and we can get you added. So everybody have a great rest of the uh, day from wherever you may be and talk to you next month. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, group.